The network of caves sprawls beneath the tallest mountain in Spain. The volcanic Mount Teda formed hollow lava tubes, and humans have dug their own caves to study these phenomena. In spring of 2007, a group of 30 scientists and nature lovers ventured into one of the many labyrinths beneath Mount Teda. After a daring rescue, many would live to tell the tale, but some would perish. This is the tragic rescue in Barranco de los Cochinillos. Before we dive into the video, I'd like to ask for your support by subscribing to our channel. Currently, only 8% of our viewers are subscribed, but your subscription helps us create more content like this. Simply click the subscribe button, like this video, and hit the bell icon to stay updated on our latest uploads. By doing so, you'll also help YouTube recommend our content to a wider audience. Without further ado, let's jump into the video. The caves below Mount Teda. The caves on the island of Tenerife are different from normal caves. Many of these caves are volcanic caves or man-made caves created to study volcanic activity on the largest island of the Canary Islands. Tenerife is a volcanic island formed by a series of eruptions that caused lava to build layers of rock and metal. Over the last 20 million years, these layers gradually rose to a mountain peak, forming Mount Teda. One of these massive eruptions fused three of the Canary Islands, each with their own mountain ranges and volcanoes. In the aftermath, a crater was left in the center of the new island. This extinct volcano would become the base of the gargantuan Mount Teda. Tenerife is centered around the ominous Mount Teda, with its summit towering 12,188 feet above ground, or 24,600 feet above sea level, making it the tallest point in Spain and the third tallest volcano on Earth. The crater of Mount Teda is 11 miles long, and beneath the volcano lies a sprawling network of lava tubes, cavernous tunnels formed by underground magma and above-ground lava flows. Barranco de los Cochinillos is a cave partially dug by humans over the past few centuries, mixing the lava tube structure with man-made tunnels bored with machines and blasts of dynamite. These tunnels were used to study the lava tubes and volcanic activity and to mine precious minerals. Some passages may connect to naturally formed lava tubes and other cave structures, creating a maze of tunnels underground. These tubes of rock lack the traditional spelioforms of regular caves, so they're less attractive to hikers and novice cavers. And they also lack the normal thrills that splunkers crave. There's less water, less vertical sections, few tight crevices, and less uncharted territory to explore. But scientists have their own reasons for studying these caves, and lava tubes come with their own dangers that even experienced cavers might not be prepared for. Tenerife was also home to the worst flight accident in history, the Tenerife Airport disaster. Back in 1977, a violent group of advocates wanted independence from Spain, so they set off a bomb at an airport. This caused chaos at other airports, including the Tenerife Airport, which had to accept landings that were originally scheduled for different airports. On March 27th, the runways were overloaded, causing two Boeing 747 jumbo jets to smash into one another, killing 583 passengers. Forty years later, a group of would-be cavers, scientists, and nature enthusiasts would become the subjects of yet another notorious disaster on Tenerife. Only this time, the tragedy would be below ground. Brilliance and Carelessness, the Tenerife Cave Disaster Back in 2007, two groups joined forces to explore the cave of Barranco de los Cochinillos on Tenerife Island. The Canaries Astrophysics Institute was one of the groups exploring the cave. The island's rich volcanic activity and high elevation have attracted scientists from all over the globe. This institute is a state-of-the-art scientific research facility. The students and scientists there build sophisticated imaging devices like telescopes and cameras used for satellite missions. They research the solar system and how galaxies form. They also manage the Teda Observatory, which was built at high altitude to get closer to the stars without interference from city lights and the atmosphere. 
Now, if all of that wasn't impressive enough, one of the greatest minds in human history, the late Stephen Hawking, was an honorary professor at the Canaries Astrophysics Institute. So, why did these brilliant scientists turn their attention away from the stars to look down into the depths below our feet? This first group of roughly 15 people wanted to study the lava tubes beneath Mount Teta because these cave formations are also found on the moon and on Mars. By exploring these caves, scientists can test robots that might one day search for life in Martian volcanic caves. The second half of the journey into Barranco de los Cochinillos was a group from the Tenerife Friends of Nature Association. Now, you'd expect scientists who don't normally study caves to team up with caving groups, but the Friends of Nature are just charity advocates for preservation efforts on the island. A couple members of the nature group said they had ventured into the cave before, but they were no splunkers. Both groups had no real guide and no caving experience, so if their journey turned deadly, they'd have almost no hope of survival. The joint expedition of roughly 30 people made mistake after mistake. The day of the cave exploration came, and the dry, arid climate of Tenerife had tricked the scientists and nature lovers into a false sense of security. They dressed in basic track suits and other athletic gear, skipping the wetsuits, sturdy overalls, watertight boots, and other insulating gear to protect them from mud, scrapes, slips, and the chill of the deep. Some might have thought that the magma from Mount Teta would keep them warm as they ventured further into the ground. Now, deeper into the ground, molten rock is still slithering through the earth, waiting for enough pressure to build when it can finally sunder the rock apart in a cataclysmic eruption. But the dried lava tubes were formed well above this molten stream. Millions of years of rock layers separated the would-be cavers from the heat of the magma. The lava tubes retained no heat and no comfort from the elements. Spirits were high as the group trekked into Barranco de los Cochinillos. The group was blissfully unaware of the dangers that lie ahead. There were almost no ropes, no extra food supplies, blankets, or other safety gear amongst the huge team of 30 cavers. Many of them even lacked light sources. These tragic mistakes didn't bother them at first, but as they trekked further inward, things slowly started to go wrong. Lava tubes are rocky, but they can also contain slippery, smooth metal. Over time, as the lava receded, the temperatures cooled, leaving sheets of mist and water that built up on the lava tube's metallic and rocky floor, making it slippery. The rough, Uneven terrain of regular caves can be hazardous, but it also provides footholds and handholds for good grip. But they were slipping on the smooth ground. The walls of the cave were almost perfectly round, with nothing to grip onto if someone fell. And they had no walking sticks or other tools for balance. These smooth pathways were inviting. It'll be an easy walk, they thought but they were fatiguing earlier than expected, which forced them to take breaks and extend the trip. To make matters worse, all the tubes and tunnels all started to look the same. There aren't many discernible features in Barranco de los Cochinillos. There were no inspiring stalactites, no cracks, no rivers, no cliffs, just a true labyrinth of stone and metal. The team continued onward as their energy and optimism faded into concern and frustration. At one point, one of the explorers, Narciso H., slipped and fell. The groups in the front didn't even notice, but he dusted himself off and continued walking. As they trudged on, Narciso started breathing heavy and he got a headache. Not wanting to worry the team more after his embarrassing fall, he kept it to himself. But soon, more people started to breathe heavier and faster. Some of the scientists led sedentary lifestyles, but many of the nature group were fit and fully capable of exploring this easy walkway. Except they also started breathing heavy. They each started to get headaches. They passed them off with excuses like maybe they didn't get enough food, maybe it was the low light. But soon, 
these headaches became unbearable, forcing more breaks as people paused to clutch their heads. Then, some members noticed an acidic taste in their mouths. Voices of concern started to rise from members of the party in short, gasping sentences. Their vision was blurring, their heads spinning with vertigo. Narciso H. leaned on the smooth walls of the cave, trying to catch his balance, but his legs gave way underneath him. Stars overtook his vision, different from the ones he gazed at with his state-of-the-art telescopes. These ones were caused by lack of oxygen to his brain. Starved of its fuel, his conscious brain shut off. His head bounced off the cavern wall, causing his bald flesh to bleed as he fell to the cavern floor. Others collapsed where they stood. Still more fell to their hands and knees as their heads bobbed, throbbing with pain and confusion. Some of the members tried to drag people in the opposite direction, but the physical exertion made them breathe deeper. Only one of the 30 explorers was still standing near the back of the group. He had fallen behind to check out strange layers of stone along a portion of the wall. His headlamp showed a ghastly sight as he rejoined his friends and colleagues. All of them were lying on the ground unconscious. He didn't know if they were alive or dead, but he turned and half ran toward the entrance cave, being careful not to slip and fall. The final mistake and a miraculous rescue. Deep below Mount Teda, the explorers started waking up. They were amazed they were alive, but they couldn't celebrate their luck. They were now coughing as their raspy voices echoed through the tunnels. They checked their watches. They had been passed out on the cave floor for over two hours. They were still dizzy, and hypothermia had begun to settle into their bones while they were unconscious. They shivered, gnashing their teeth in the biting chill of Barranco de los Cochinillos Cavern. Panicked, they started hypothesizing about what had happened. The obvious answer was gas from the magma beneath the cave. If it was volcanic gas, then they had no idea when more could seep through the rock and suffocate them again. However, some of the explorers weren't convinced of the danger. They dubbed it a freak accident. They had been down here before, and no problems like this ever happened. Mount Teta wasn't very active, so it was very unlikely that another gas leak could happen. It would require molten rock to interact with other chemicals to burn. Even if chemicals were burning right now, it would require large amounts to build up enough pressure to overcome the atmospheric pressure of the cave, which gets stronger the deeper you go. It would probably take days, weeks, or even years for enough pressure to build before another gas leak fumigated Barranco de los Cochinillos. Or so they thought. Six members of the group agreed to push onward, even as their heads pounded in pain. But the rest weren't going to risk it. They started walking to the exits. They were already feeling the pressure of a life and death situation, reinvigorated to get out as soon as possible. The only question was, which way is out? The chaos of the situation had disoriented them. When they awoke, they weren't sure which way was forward and which way was back. Panic erupted through the ranks. It was every person for themselves. Around this time, the only scientist who didn't pass out fell on his face as he stumbled out through the exit of Barranco de los Cochinillos. Eventually, he shuffled further out and called for help. The Spanish Mountain Rescue and Intervention Groups, or GRIME, sent their special unit over to the scene but they were a good distance away. Local fire squads and other first responders got there in no time. Just as they arrived, more people started pouring out of the cave. They thought it was a miracle. There were so many people here, they must have all made it out. But slowly they realized half the group was still missing. The rescue crews knew that the man-made portion of the cave ended in a dead end. If the others reached that portion, they could wait for rescue or turn around. The rescuers knew where to find them as long as they didn't wander down any side passages or any new connection points. They got to work, situating large fans at the cave's entrance to vent any fumes out of the cave. Some of these industrial-sized rescue fans are capable of clearing the air in subway sewers, so they could surely handle the cave. Rescuers suited up with respirators and gas masks to filter the air, allowing them safe passage into the cave. 
Since the cave didn't have the typical hazards, rescuers brought the bare minimum equipment. Some stretchers that could be pulled along the ground, attached to ropes or carried, and some rope and carabiners to attach themselves to the skids. There shouldn't be any tough cave formations to haul the cavers through. It should be in and out, unless any of them sustained physical trauma. The rescue team walked silently into the depths of Barranco de los Cochinillos. After less than an hour, the rescuers found the first group and slowly brought them out one at a time. Of those who made it out, six foreign scientists and members of the nature crew were immediately loaded onto helicopters and airlifted to a nearby hospital. Meanwhile, half of the crew ventured deeper within. They heard no sound as they crept inward. They saw no lights. No one knew it at the time, but this group of scientists and explorers weren't exposed to deadly gases released by magma from deep below. The amateur cavers were suffocating. There were too many people in the constricted tunnels of Barranco de los Cochinillos, and they were simply running out of air. As they inhaled all the remaining oxygen-rich air, they exhaled carbon dioxide, a colorless, odorless gas that causes all the symptoms they were experiencing earlier. Normal CO2 levels are around 0.03%, but the amount in caves can easily rise above that baseline. Caves with 1% CO2 or more are dubbed foul air caves, and a concentration of 10% or more could instantly stop human lungs from functioning. Earlier in the day, the CO2 levels were just high enough to cause everyone to pass out. But as they passed out, their breathing slowed down, allowing the CO2 levels to drop. If they had brought an experienced caver with them, they could have stood a chance. Cavers developed the naked flame test for this exact situation. You just light a flame and walk forward to test the air. For decades, cavers thought high CO2 atmospheres would cause flames to burn out. And that's true. But it turns out that a flame will burn out in any low oxygen environment, including those tainted by other toxins. They were brilliant scientists, but they knew about the gas of the stars, not about the air inside caves. A group of six ambitious cavers found the end of the tunnel. They thought it would be good to rest. There was no obvious signs of additional gas leak, but once again, their logic failed them. There was already low oxygen in the area, and each shallow breath they took exhaled more of the same poisonous carbon dioxide into the air. The fresh air from beyond this pocket couldn't reach them. All the atmospheric pressure concentrated the air into this very spot. As they stood there at the cave's end, the CO2 levels rose once more, and each of them collapsed again. Only this time, they didn't wake up. Rescuers squeezed through the narrowing tunnels leading to the dead end and found them. One Italian man studying at the Astrophysics Institute and five other Spanish people, all dead. Now, as far as cave deaths go, they died peacefully rather than the violent, agonizing, and panic deaths that normally claim the lives of splunkers. That's the story of how a joint expedition by the Canaries Astrophysics Institute and the Tenerife Friends of Nature Association turned deadly when 30 people suffocated deep below ground in Barranco de los Cochinillos. Would you be brave enough to venture into a lava tube or a man-made cave? Let us know your daring experiences in the comments below. Click the like button and subscribe to the channel to catch more videos like this one.